Welcome to Lawyerpreneur, where we discuss creativity, entrepreneurship, and other trailblazing that enables us to distinguish ourselves from others, because being a lawyer doesn't have to mean doing business as usual. I am your host, Jeremy Richter. Today's episode is brought to you by Alps, who wishes you a happy spring. After a year that was anything but easy, Alps is committed to bringing ease to insurance. Alps is the nation's largest direct writer of lawyer's malpractice insurance. That means you have direct access to your insurance team from account managers to claims attorneys. And Alps has the simplest, most straightforward online application out there. Qualifying firms can even apply, see rates, and bind coverage all in about 20 minutes. When it comes to continuing your coverage, Alps makes that easy too with 100% online renewal. With Alps, you can spend less time insurancing and more time innovating. Get started at applyonline.alpsinsurance.com. That's applyonline.alpsinsurance.com. In addition to the corporate sponsorship that helps pay for the hosting and transcription of the show, you can support Lawyerpreneur on Patreon at patreon.com slash lawyerpreneur. For less than the cost of a point one, you can help pay for the time it takes to create and edit Lawyerpreneur and receive copies of my two most recent books, Stop Putting Out Fires and Level Up Your Law Practice. Now, on to the show. My guest today is David Latt, who needs no introduction, but as the founder of Above the Law, has been instrumental in the way that legal and law firm news is consumed. He is also the author of a novel, Supreme Ambitions. David, welcome to Lawyerpreneur. Hey, thanks for having me, Jeremy. All right, so I just want to jump right into some questions about you here. When you went to law school and then started into your legal career, did you anticipate that you would have a traditional career or was it always in your mind that your career might be uh, non-standard? I actually anticipated I would have a fairly traditional career. Uh, when I was in law school, I was interested in litigation. Uh, I applied to clerk after law school. Uh, I summered at a law firm, much like uh, many law school students. Uh, so I thought I was going to have a fairly normal career uh, as a litigator. And when did that start to change? So I had a fairly normal career uh, for the first couple of years after law school. Uh, I clerked uh, on the Ninth Circuit for Judge O'Scanlan. It was was a wonderful experience. I worked at Wachtell Lipton in New York for a few years. And then I was an assistant U.S. attorney or federal prosecutor in Newark, New Jersey, under then U.S. attorney Chris Christie. And it was while I was in the U.S. attorney's office that kind of on a lark in 2004, uh, I started a blog uh, on the side. This was in the early days of blogging. Uh, It was called Underneath Their Robes. And it was essentially a news gossip and humor website about federal judges. And since I was appearing before judges as a prosecutor, I did not do this under my actual name. I (laughs) came up with a pseudonym. And that's kind of where the writing started for me. I was doing it really just as a sideline or a hobby to kind of keep things interesting. But the site developed a following. And then eventually I did leave the full-time practice of law to focus on blogging and writing. All right. So when you, so you did the blogging for a while, when you got ready to transition away from actively practicing, did you have any significant mental or emotional hurdles with doing that? Oh, absolutely. I think it was very nerve wracking uh, because you invest a lot of time and money into your legal career and your legal education. And I had had a fairly successful legal career right out of law school for those six, seven years after law school. And it was nerve wracking to think, wow, I'm leaving this. And what if this new venture doesn't work out? What if I can't come back? Um, So it was very uh, anxiety producing. And the other challenge I would say besides just the anxiety is being a lawyer comes with a certain amount of status. Uh, You're looked up to, uh, you're viewed as a leader, you're viewed as successful. Uh, It's often quite lucrative. And the field that I was entering, uh, blogging, online journalism, was not really a very established field in uh, 2006, which is really when I was uh, thinking about leaving. Uh, So you also take this hit on status, and uh, it can be very 
difficult, especially for lawyers who do tend to be very status conscious. Yeah, I know a bunch of the folks that I've talked to, I think Alex Sue comes to mind, who is a lawyer, or is a lawyer, but, and he was in big law for a while, and then left to go be part of a startup uh, that sells software and be in the sales side of that. And when I talked with him, he said, it was tough because you know that when people see this on LinkedIn or they just, you know, hear about he left law and now he's doing this sales thing, you know that they think differently of you. And does it really matter to you? I mean, some, but mostly you're not going to see those people anymore. But that's a I know it's a big obstacle for people. Yeah, you really have to have the courage of your convictions and to believe that what you're doing is important and worthwhile and to find that fulfilling because Uh, In terms of many traditional metrics, prestige, compensation, what have you, practicing law is a very good job. Sure. Um, And so I do litigation, have done for the last nine years. I've been at the same firm. It is a good job, but it uh, (laughs) I think we all know it has certain baggage and uh, difficulties to go along with it. But um, um, all right. So what did the timeline look like for you from 2004 to leaving the practice to do your 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 website full time. Yeah, so what happened essentially was I was at the US Attorney's office. Uh, I was thinking about uh, leaving and I got an offer uh, to join a blog uh, called Wonket, which covered politics. Uh, it was owned by a company called the Gawker Media, which no longer exists, and that's a whole separate story. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, but a whole different this was, story. <laughs> this was my first opportunity as a full-time blogger, and I was uh, debating about whether to accept this. This was around December of 05, January of 06, and then finally I said, you know what, I'll just go for it, and we'll see what happens, and if it doesn't work out, well, then maybe I can try and find a way back to practicing law, but I just didn't want to be older and uh, thinking to myself, wow, I wish I had tried out that other thing. So that's kind of why I did it. And then I did Wonket for about half a year. I found I enjoyed blogging, but I missed writing about law and the legal profession, which is really my focus. And so in the summer of 2006, uh, I launched Above the Law. All right. So what was the catalyst for that first judicial gossip blog? Yeah. So I very much wanted to write. Uh, I had enjoyed writing in high school when I was the editor of the Opinion Journal and in college when I was a columnist for the school newspaper. And writing briefs, which is what I was mainly doing in the U.S. Attorney's Office, isn't quite the same. It's a much more formal type of writing. You're not putting your personality in there. You're sort of constrained by the requirements of the form, by the position of your client, which in my case was the federal government. I wanted to do something that was a little more lively and fun. I've always had this side of my personality that's a little more irreverent or cheeky, not as uh, as stuffy, uh, perhaps. And so I thought, you know what, let me try this whole blogging thing, which was just starting to get traction. And everybody says, well, write what you know. And I was very fascinated and remain very fascinated by the federal judiciary. I have a great deal of admiration for judges in many ways. They're like idols to me. And so I thought, you know what, let me start this blog, which was occasionally irreverent or snarky, but 90% of the time was really worshipful and adulatory Mm. towards judges. It was really like a fanzine for judges. (laughs) All right. So when you decided to come out from behind the handle and no longer be anonymous, what was the level of concern about that? So it's funny, the way it happened was, uh, so I had this anonymous email account that I used for the blog to correspond with readers. And along the way, I made connections with different journalists. And one of the journalists I connected with was Jeffrey Tubin of The New Yorker, who's no longer there for, that's a whole other story too. But anyway, uh, we struck up this friendship. I didn't tell him who I really was. Uh, But at a certain point, I mentioned that I was in the New York area because I was working in New Jersey in the U.S. Attorney's Office, but I was living in Manhattan. And he said, oh, if you're in Manhattan, you should come by uh, the Condé Nast cafeteria where the New Yorker is based and we'll have lunch. And I can tell you about my own career and how I moved from practicing law to writing about it. So that seemed like a great opportunity to me. So I did meet up with Jeff and we had a great lunch and he gave me a lot of good advice. And at the end of the lunch, he said, you know, if you ever want to reveal yourself as the author of this blog, which had acquired something of a cult following in a very narrow circle among judges. It was read by Supreme Court justices, even law clerks, Mm -hmm. but it was still fairly narrow, but niche. 
Uh, he said, I would love to write about you and reveal you as the author of this blog that a lot of people are talking about. So at the time I said, thanks, but no thanks, because I realized, oh, it could get me in trouble at the day job, which is why I had put it under, where yeah. I had started it under a pseudonym in the first place. Then what happened was, as time went on, uh, I started to get emails from readers who clearly knew who I was. They would say, oh, hey, I'm coming to Newark, uh, New Jersey. Do you want to have coffee? Or, hey, how come you don't write more about your old boss, Judge O'Scanlan? And it turned out the reason these people knew was in the early days of the blog, I didn't understand anything about technology and about IP addresses. And so I was emailing as my blog, uh, in my blog capacity, and I was emailing as David Latt, and anyone who opened up the full original messages and looked at the so-called metadata could see this IP address, this four-digit identifier corresponding to computing session, and they could put two and two together and figure, okay, David Latt and my blog alter ego, I called myself Article 3 Groupie after Article 3 of the Constitution, which establishes the judiciary. David Latt and Article 3 Groupie are the same person. So a few people had figured this out early on. At a certain point, I invested in software that would mask my IP address, but it was sort of too late by then. They told some people who told some people who told some people. And a year and a half into this supposedly anonymous venture, there were a number of people who knew who I was. So at that point, I thought, OK, if I'm actually going to be revealed, I would rather go out in a blaze of glory in the pages of The New Yorker in an article <laughs> by a friendly journalist uh, yeah. than be revealed by some random other blogger who would post screenshots of my emails. Uh, so I called Jeff back and I said, you know, that article you mentioned, I actually would be interested in doing that. And so that article, which was a talk of the town piece in the front part of the magazine, the shorter items that appeared in November of 2005. So this will be related to that. One of the cornerstone pieces of advice that people give to aspiring entrepreneurs, and I don't know if you considered yourself that at the time, but is to find a hole in the market for something that people want or need and, and fill that gap. But identifying that isn't always as obvious as it might sound. Clearly, you did find a hole in the market here with something that people were interested in, at least in a certain niche. Um, was that intentional uh, or was it that it just happened to be you're interested in this and perhaps other people are too sort of thing? More the latter, I would say. Uh, I was interested in uh, these types of topics. And so... I had decided, you know what, I'm going to write about this thing that nobody else is writing about. So for example, um, Supreme Court law clerk hiring, this is a very inside baseball thing, but these are great jobs working alongside justices of the Supreme Court. They're very prestigious and you get a, an inside look into the workings of the Supreme Court. This wasn't really covered in a journalistic way until I started doing it. And the main reason I started doing it was I wanted to know who was getting hired. Uh, so things like that, uh, but I totally agree with you. You have to find this gap in the market. The same thing happened later with Above the Law, where we started much more granular, in-depth coverage of law firm compensation and law firm policies like parental leave and vacation policy and things like that. And again, it's not exactly, well, I don't know, in some ways it's exciting because it helps people pay off their loans sooner or you know, yeah. feed their families. But you know, it's not necessarily controversial or political or, or anything like that, but it's news that people wanted to have and they weren't getting it. And so we started to cover this and we found that it was very, very popular. But we kind of stumbled upon it accidentally. The historical way that bonuses were covered is you would write about what the leader would do, usually Cravath in New York, and then everyone, that would be kind of it because everyone would often follow Cravath. But one year I had a bonus memo for some other firm, maybe it was Milbank, and I thought, you know what, let me just post this Milbank memo, what the heck. And it got a lot of traction, even though it was just following what Kravath had done. And so then I started to post all the other memos, and sometimes firms would do something different, actually, not just what Kravath had done. And firms in different parts of the country had different compensation schemes compared to what Kravath was doing in New York. And so it really became this whole cottage industry tracking the different policies surrounding compensation at law firms. And now I think above the law is really the definitive source for that type of information. Do you feel like reporting on those things and, and shedding a broader light on them has affected change within the legal community? Yeah, I think so. Uh, certainly, I think it accelerates the pace of change. In general, compensation uh, changes ripple throughout the profession. They start off in New York and then they go to the rest of the country. Now it happens a lot faster because you're not waiting to read about it or hear about it. It's pretty much there in your inbox, on your browser. It happens much more quickly. The other thing I will say is, 
in the fight for talent, law firms want to be competitive. And so if you write about something good that a law firm is doing, many other firms will emulate it. So one topic that we covered at Above the Law was parental leave, how much uh, parental leave were uh, law firms giving to associates who had children. And we covered one firm, I believe it was Oric, that had a very generous policy. And then suddenly everybody else was following that policy because they didn't want to be losing talent to Oric. And so that I think helped parental leave uh, move up from a standard of around 12 weeks to something like 20 weeks now. So there are definitely these changes. I guess the final example I'll mention is diversity. Above the law has been a big voice on diversity and inclusion in the legal profession for years. Uh, and in the past year, in the wake of some of the terrible events, such as the killing of George Floyd, uh, law firms and other legal employers have really started to focus on diversity. But this was something that was happening even before the pandemic. And I think in large, you know, in significant part because of what Above the Law and other outlets were doing in terms of writing about the need for diversity. I think you're right. Um, the coverage of it's important. And then what we're finally seeing now is clients who are mandating yep. it. If yep. you're going to be working on our files, here's what we have yep. to see from you. Yep. Coca-Cola just instituted such a policy. Um, AbbVie has a policy. A lot of major American co corporations have such policies. And I'm, the work I do is insurance defense. And it's, you know, so some of the big law stuff seems like such a, it could be almost be a different planet from, <laughs> from what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. But we're seeing the same thing on the corporate side where the big insurance companies are saying, hey, um, y'all look the same and have for about the last mm -hmm. 50 years. Let's see yeah. some, you know, something different here. <laughs> um, all right. Changing directions a little bit. You talked about that you wrote some in high school and wanted to really get back to that. I don't know how much self-analysis you had done, self-analysis you had done at that point. Cause I know for me that the writing and the creativity and the self-assessment of these things kind of came later. But at that point, did you consider yourself a creative person and were looking for outlets to express that creativity? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I would say so. Uh, I think sometimes when we think of creativity, maybe we think more of visual arts or music or something like that. But writing is definitely a creative endeavor. And so uh, I think I did consider myself a creative writer. And certainly I have uh, dabbled a little in fiction over the years too. I did some fiction writing workshops in college. And as you mentioned, I wrote a novel. So I've done a little bit of that too. And I think that's perhaps more obviously creative than something more journalistic. All right, let's talk about the novel. Um, novel you wrote is Supreme Ambitions. Did you enjoy writing? Yes, I did. It was a lot of fun. It was sort of like one of those bucket list items. I'd always wanted to write a novel. I'm an avid reader of fiction myself. And uh, it was something I just did, always wanted to do. And uh, finally, I guess in 2014, 2015, uh, I was able to do it. It was published. And uh, yeah, it was well received. I was pleased about that. Uh, but it was something I'd always wanted to do. And I said it in the legal world, um, in the world of clerking and the federal judiciary specifically, which was, again, the world that I know very well and one that I'm fascinated by. And so I think it helps when you're writing to find something that you're enthusiastic about. Yeah. And I can really identify that with that because in this past year, I wrote after having bailed on a couple of novels, I finally completed my first one. Um, and something I've read and thought about when you were talking there is that everybody says that your first novel is always semi-autobiographical. Yes. <laughs> is that true Mine for was. yours as well? Mine yeah. was. I had a female protagonist, but she was very similar to me. She yeah. went to Yale Law School. She clerked for a Ninth Circuit judge. She aspired to clerk for the Supreme Court herself. So there was a lot of autobiography, which, again, makes sense. Um, any other plans to write another one? So I'm not, uh, you know, I've, I had, I did have some ideas for a sequel, but I've sort of put it on the, the back burner. Um, what I'm doing now is I have a new publication on the platform Substack. It's called Original Jurisdiction. And it's really me writing about law and the legal profession, but just solo. Um, one of the things that uh, was, you know, that happened as Above the Law grew larger is I found myself spending less time on the writing and spending more time on administration and editing and events and other things and less time doing the writing, which is really what I loved. And so uh, last December, uh, during the pandemic, uh, I started this new publication and it's just me. I don't have any co-writers. Uh, it's just me, my voice. Uh, I get to write what I like. Uh, 
And it's been a lot of fun. It's been nice to sort of return to, to basics. My audience, of course, is very small compared to Above the Law, but it's been a lot of fun. And I'm reminded of why I got into writing in the first place. All right. So what's the easiest way for people to find that? Oh, it's very easy. It's just davidlatt.substack.com. Uh, people can subscribe. It's uh, free. At a certain point, I might start charging something like a lot of the writers on Substack. But for now, it's uh, free to sign up. You could probably also just Google it. Uh, the title of it is Original Jurisdiction. So if you Googled Original Jurisdiction and David Latt, you could probably find it pretty easily. I also link to it from my Twitter page as well in my bio. Well, I really like hearing that you you've gone back to writing because in listening to and in interviewing people so frequently, what happens is what you've just described is that the businesses grow yeah. and then the writer, the entrepreneur gets away from the part of the business that they that got them into it in the first place. Yeah. So have you found it to be fulfilling and enjoyable to get back to that again? Yeah, absolutely. It's been a lot of fun. And it's great to just interact with readers, to have people email you or uh, send you a message uh, over social media because of something that they read that resonated. Uh, so it's it's great. In some ways, it's like a return to the early days of blogging. Uh, there are a lot of writers from the early days of blogging who are now on Substack or similar platforms. And it's, again, a way of connecting very directly with your readers. Yeah, we keep hearing about, I mean, and have for years now, the death of blogging, but it always seems like that instead of dying, people are finding new and innovative ways to do it differently and connect with readers because people want to read and yep. and connect with folks. No, absolutely. And even social media, Twitter or Facebook, you could view it as a form of blogging or microblogging, as some people say. If you're writing a thread on Twitter with multiple parts or you write a Facebook status, it's pretty lengthy and thoughtful. It very much is like a blog post. So uh, it maybe it's not necessarily called blogging anymore, but uh, online writing, journalism, I don't know what you want to call it, digital, right? but uh, it's very much like, like blogging. It has that original element of communication. All right. So this is going to take a, a right turn. So we're recording this on March 31st. And I think we are approaching, or you are approaching, the uh, the one year anniversary of your discharge from the hospital. Yes. <laughs> after after your initial COVID experience. So how are you doing now a year later? Yeah. So April one is when I was discharged from the hospital. So you're right. It, it's ex almost exactly a year. And I'm happy to report that I'm doing a lot better. Um, last year, this time of year, I was in the hospital with a very severe case of COVID-19. I was there for about three weeks, including almost a week on a ventilator. I was having a hard time breathing. Uh, I feel much, much better now. I feel mostly recovered. The one lingering thing I have is that when I exercise, I get short of breath very quickly. And so that's something that we're looking at. I'm talking to my cardiologist and my pulmonologist to kind of get to the bottom of that. But I feel very fortunate because many other COVID survivors have reported all kinds of mysterious and long lasting ailments. And for me, really, it's only this one thing. And it happens only when I exercise, really, not as mm. I just go about my day-to-day -day life. So uh, I feel very, uh, I feel, you know, very fortunate. You chose very early on in your COVID experience to be public about it and to share it. And, you know, in March, and it was, it was early, mid-March that the world kind of shut down. And I think that that was a really courageous decision because there was so much unknown. And certainly you didn't know what the outcome was going to be for you at that point. Um, why did you make that decision? So again, it's something that I kind of stumbled into a little bit like blogging or some of the stuff that I did at Above the Law. Originally, I just went on social media to notify people who had had in-person interaction with me that I had COVID and apologies, but I might have given it to you inadvertently. I didn't know. Uh, yeah. So if you start to come down with symptoms, you should get yourself tested and you should quarantine. So that's what I originally did. But I got such an outpouring of love and support and good wishes from that. I thought, well, you know what? I'll just keep doing this. I'll keep talking about what I'm going through. So essentially I live tweeted my COVID hospitalization. And in some ways there's a similarity between what I did over the years at Underneath Their Robes and Above the Law, which is essentially take something that's unknown and opaque and try to make it a little more understood and a little more transparent. So whether that's the federal judiciary or the world of large law firms or the novel coronavirus, because it was novel and new and we didn't understand yeah. it. Uh, that's something that is a thread that runs through my career. 
And I think for a lot of people that, you know, we knew that there were people who were getting COVID. Uh, but I think for a lot of people, and certainly for me, not that I know you, but you were the first person that I have some knowledge of, you know, that I kind of feel like I know who you are, even though until this conversation, we never met, but someone you can identify with who had it. And then we were able to, you know, in a, in a way, experience it with you and watch you go through it, that that was, it was, it was a lot. <laughs> you know, I've had a lot of people say just what you said, Jeremy, that you were really the first person I knew or knew of who had this. And people have said that it helped them take it more seriously. Uh, yeah. Because at the time I was 44, I was in relatively good health. I did have this asthma history, but by the time I got sick, it was really just exercise induced asthma that I would manage with an inhaler. So overall, I was a pretty young, healthy person and COVID just really knocked me down. And uh, like I said, I was on a ventilator. It was really touch and go. I was in the ICU for a week. So, you know, I think for a lot of people, uh, they tell me, wow, it really helped me realize that this could be dangerous, including to relatively young, I'm not super young, but relatively young, relatively healthy people. So when you, you got out of the hospital, got to where you could talk and conduct interviews, you had a lot of opportunities <laughs> to take it beyond social media and go on, you know, major networks. Was that something that, I mean, again, I, I felt like that was just really brave to be open about the story like that. Was that something you were comfortable with from the beginning? open person in a lot of ways and uh, having written about my experience certainly uh, it was like that um, so yeah I felt um, I felt fairly comfortable with it uh, I gave interviews to the Today Show and the, I was on the Rachel Maddow show and Nightline and a number of other shows I was part of a one-year retrospective for CBS this morning and again I really want to just alert people to how seriously we need to take this and the toll it can take upon people. So we've talked a lot about past accomplishments, which are extraordinary and all the things you've done in the last 15 years. Is there anything particular that's next or that you're looking ahead to? Yeah. So, you know, uh, <laughs> I guess the other thing that's really been a big change over the past couple of years is just parenthood. I, my husband and I, we have a three-year-old son and, uh, that's been just a lot of fun and very rewarding. And it's just amazing to see their minds develop and see them develop personalities. It can be challenging because our son is three right now and he often doesn't want to do what we want him to do. <laughs> but we uh, have, it really gives, yeah, <laughs> gives you a we sense We have a two-year-old and in, I, a six-year-old and a two-year-old who are very okay. different people. And so that's kind of fun to watch. But in the last couple, the month or so, the two-year-old has developed this uh, obstinate streak that yeah. it's uh i can really identify with what you're saying yeah <laughs> was your six-year-old more uh was easier in in some ways he was his his just took a different form than hers hers is just i'll give an example and when she gets older and can find these things she'll probably hate me for it but um like a couple of weeks ago on a sunday morning she was sitting at the breakfast table and there was a lot of food left on her plate and she wasn't interested in eating it. So I told her just eat two more bites and you can be done. And she looks at me and crosses her arms and says, never. <laughs> I was like, wow, I thought I had like 10 more years before I get that kind of. Exactly. Attitude. Right. And so his was never that direct kind of just rebellious nature. It was uh, maybe it was more subversive, but it's okay. just different. Yeah, yeah. Our son is more like your daughter. He's never, no, very, very uh, contrarian right now. <laughs> yeah. So parenthood is not for the weak of heart. No, definitely not. But it's exciting, though, and it's rewarding. And that's, I think, you know, it takes up it takes up a lot of your time. I mean, certainly the challenges of being a working parent are well documented, but uh, you know, I wouldn't trade it for the world, as they say. Oh, for sure. And I know, you know, this last year has been terrible for so many people, including yourself, obviously. But one of the things that it afforded me and has afforded me is the opportunity to have been at home a lot more than we would have. And yep. I will, I have continued to allow myself to be more flexible 
in where I'm working because obviously we've we've all shown it at this point that we can we can get the work done wherever we're at. So now yeah. I've chosen to continue that and have just really enjoyed that that part of what is otherwise a really lousy experience for everybody. <laughs> no, no, exactly. So true. <laughs> well, I really uh, enjoyed having you on today. Where can people find and follow you? I'm sure most people will know, but just in case. Yep, I'm very easy to find. I'm on Twitter at David Latt. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. Uh, you can find me through my um, my new uh, publication, Original Jurisdictions, just davidlatt.substack.com. And the email is just David Latt, one word, at Substack. Uh, I also do some legal recruiting, so you can find me through the company I work with, Lateral Link. Uh, I'm probably one of the easiest people to find on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time and coming on today. Hey, thank you so much, Jeremy. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed today's show. Please take time to rate and subscribe at whatever podcatcher you're listening on. And if you want more from me, you can find me at jeremywrichter.com. You can also find me on Twitter at RichterJW. And if you want the extra audio and benefits available at Patreon, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash lawyerpreneur. Thanks for listening.